if I'm sleeping on the sidewalk under the bridge, I could care less about those rights. Levels of inequality makes it impossible for people to even exercise the democracy we're talking about. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I am very excited to bring you one of the most popularly requested guests on this channel, the chairperson of the Public Service Commission, Professor Somadota Figeni. Prof, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me, Sizwe, and uh, greetings to your viewers. It's a great pleasure to have you. You're well known as one of South Africa's foremost political analysts, but of course you've moved in recent times, I think in 2022, became very important public official in South Africa as the chairperson of the Public Service Commission. Um, you've had a life where you've been between academia and uh, the world of practice. Tell us about that, that life of yours and how you've been interested both in the life of the mind and scholarship, but also always uh, contributing out into the real world, so to speak, as well. Yes. This actually starts right from my upbringing, as well as the early years as a student activist. Mm. The issue of being engaged in community development work, it's what drove me to be curious about scholarship. So when I became a student at the University of Transkei in the 80s, mm. mid-80s, mm. The likes of Batando and Dondo and other leaders of student movement then often emphasized what I think might have been the influence of Steve Bigo mm. that be embedded in your community, be involved so that whatever politics you have is informed, whatever activism you have by the needs of the community you live in, mm. that rootedness. So when I went to the university, it was mainly to understand those dynamics I'd seen in my community. So to me, it has always been a practice-driven intellectual curiosity. Mm. Hence, I started, before I even finished the university years, the Mount Aleph Development Agency, which started winter schools, agitation for building of bridges and other things and so forth, mm. as a student. So I've never at any given time separated knowledge or scholarship from practice. Yeah. Even as I prepared for my courses or classes that I chose, mine was to understand the world better. Passing and moving to the next level was just a natural byproduct. Mm. I never studied <clears throat> to memorize and pass. Sure. So that has always been the case to say, now that I'm in a privileged position of knowledge, mm. and uh, which only the elite few have up to the level of a PhD, mm. how do I use that to the advantage of society in their quest for development, social justice, and so forth? Mm. So to me, I've never been preoccupied with what a scholar does, how many uh, publications you should send in order to get the next promotion. Mm -hmm. Sure. I published and I got involved in research work that I felt had a meaning to me. Mm. Even the topics I chose for my master's, for my PhD, they were driven just by that curiosity to understand things. Mm. So my scholarship it's not driven by scholarship for its sake. I never thought or even wished to be a career academic. Mm, mm. I always wanted to be an activist scholar. I'm just interested on that note, um, if you have any, any thoughts or words of wisdom for people who are pursuing their PhDs at the moment and, and scholarship. Uh, we've spoken to a number of academics on this channel and it would be fascinating to get your your thoughts on that journey, especially for the PhD, which is a very deep intellectual journey. How do you navigate it and how do you overcome that that obstacle? 
The first thing I think should not be driven by you changing a title to be a doctor. Mm. But you should be saying, what knowledge should I excavate such that it is a major contribution to the body of knowledge? Sure. What topic fascinates me? Because that's what will sustain you. Mm. Mm. And that's what will keep your intellectual stamina. PhD can be a very lonely process, can Absolutely. be a very difficult process. Sometimes the interpersonal dynamics between the supervisor mm -hmm. and the student. So first, choose a topic that you think will sustain you. Yeah. And also look at whether you'll be able to get the data. And more importantly, the kind of a supervisor you get. Mm -hmm. Sometimes tend to be more important even than the institution itself because sure. that engagement and many people in the academia will ask who was your promoter, your supervisor, mm. and so forth. Mm. And uh, start interesting yourself in a range of journal articles and articles on the subject that you want to pursue to yeah. see if not a lot has been written, if answers have been uh, I mean, uh, given to that. Mm the resilience of a PhD student being in that lonely journey and yeah. the discipline becomes very important. Absolutely. And you must be intellectually curious. You must be driven. But the other mistake many students do, mm. they want to solve world's problems in one thesis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you must All always time. say, what is practical? How do you prioritize? How do you sequence it so that you finish and get it out of the way? Mm. You will have all your life now to write things you want sure. to write. You can even challenge your own thesis for that mm. matter. Mm. So that's what I would say is needed. You need a lot of support from your family, friends, and the environment because some students get stressed and they can't deal with that psychological challenge mm. and so on. So all those things, I would say, it's what drives a student. During that period, get engaged in conferences and things that are in your area, always know what is the latest and so forth. Mm. In the American system, they even have something they call comprehensive exams to test you in the area of your specialization you're given six or eight hours to write hmm. <laughs> and you are isolated in this cubicle or something. Mm. So that too can be quite strenuous. I've seen mm. it takes a toll on some students, but always pace yourself and uh, make sure that you have resilience. Let's come on to some of uh, the, the questions of you know public importance um, with which you're engaged. And I suppose we're celebrating 30 years of democracy this year. So... Let's start there and maybe get your assessment of where South Africa stands 30 years into this democratic experiment. Well, I do think that South Africa moves in a very interesting manner from being a pariah of the world mm -hmm. in a deep crisis late 80s. And that triggers some negotiations behind the scenes because the situation was no longer, uh, you know, sustainable. Yeah. But at that moment, liberation movement is too strong to be defeated. But it is too weak to have an outright win. Sure. Same with the apartheid system. So there is an impasse. So it is within that context that negotiations take place. As you would know, rational choice theories, I'm sure people were making calculations about these weaknesses, strength and so forth. The Cold War had actually uh, ended and uh, now the traditional supporters of the liberation movement were on the retreat. Sadak countries in the front line had taken a, a, you know, a lot of punches from the apartheid regime. So mm. th there was a mood to say, let's encourage these changes. Namibia now had moved on and so forth. Mm. So it is in that context that negotiations take place. Sure. Mandela and other prisoners are released. We started so well. Mm. And anybody, I do know that 
as we move towards elections and transition, sure. the first casualty, as somebody said in the morning in another context, mm. is usually in a conflict or contestation is the truth and yeah. complexity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When we started, RDP starts, we see electrification, mm. we see uh, communication services spreading out and so forth, we see infrastructure, the spreading of social security and so forth. So things start on the high. Yeah. We even had this bold experiment of reconciliation, truth and reconciliation. But I think we lost steam after only 10 years of our democracy. Hmm. And all the gains that were made started retreating. Hmm. One of the reasons for that was one, our transition privileged more the building of the architecture of democracy, the institutions. Sure, sure. But it didn't pay much attention on a sustainable basis on the socioeconomic transformation. Mm -hmm. The second one was the virtual implosion of the ruling, uh, you know, elite political uh, party when they went into this infighting factionalism, mm. a very self-destructive mode. Mm. Of course, corruption became rampant, patronage system and so forth, institutions are weakened and so Excellent. on. So that was one uh, second part of this. Mm. And uh, I would say that the third one, which we often do not elevate, is the underestimation of the resistance of those who wanted the status quo to be maintained. Hmm. Because whatever push you had, there was going to be a counter push. Hmm. In any counter hegemonic struggle, uh, do know that hegemons do not come and say, we've come to sign a surrender. Hmm. They'll find all ways and different permutations and they'll evolve into different spaces of resistance. That's what we experienced that taking place in the context of our both business and political elite not being principled enough to keep their eyes on the prize mm. of transformation mm. so what happened is that they are subsumed by the system they are absorbed they assimilate they came in to transform the institution the institution transformed them so once you are inside that, of course, within the broader context of the global system as well, which now was generally unipolar, it became very difficult. There was dissensus, there was mm. all this incongruence, splinter groups and uh, fragmentation. So we move from being the flavor of the world, being taken into textbooks of Oxford, of Harvard, of mm. Princeton, and so forth, of Cambridge, as the model. Countries travel to South Africa, converge here to learn how do you do your homegrown reconciliation or political negotiations. Mm. We throw that one away. And now we became the most unequal society in the world. Youth unemployment, scandalous at the level. We start having all these other challenges, uh, load shedding, the freight and rail infrastructure, staggering and so forth. And also remember, even as we talk of corruption, it's both mm. private and public sector. Sure. But media, of course, has put it on only one side. Mm -hmm. The other side has access to resources but doesn't have the sophistication. To, 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 to do the looting and so forth. So yeah. this is what I think mm, mm. happened. But there have been glimmers of hope at times. Sure. When we thought all is lost, here in a symbolic sense, but with practical implications, was the World Cup. Just when we thought we had lost it all mm. and we were just a laughing stock of the world, mm and jokes were being made about us. The World Cup came and cynics were saying it's going to be the worst. Mm. And 
we came out actually having a very decent, which was said to be one of the best. Yeah. Why? Because public sector, political leaders, business leaders, civil society understood this moment. Mm. They came together, collaborated. And uh, I would dare say that even criminals had a moratorium in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for that period. Yeah. Yes, for that period. And uh, we put up a show, yeah. which was just a wave of a moment of national pride. Mm. We do have these moments, again, during COVID-19. Mm. If you take out the PPE scandals that were there, sure. we had a decent arrangement of trying to come together mm. and work from private sector to public sector to do things. Mm. Also criminals and took so a forth. break then And criminals well. <laughs> at that time, the crime stats, yeah. Uh, I think they feared death as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that in itself was an indicator yeah. that when you leave one role player, mm. such as political leadership, to monopolize the stage, the wrong things will happen. Mm. Mm. When you leave business leaders alone on the stage, wrong things may happen. When yeah. you leave civil society, but when you have collaboration and there is a common purpose that is well defined, mm. You begin to see beautiful things. After all, that took me back to the moments in our history. When the Union of South Africa was coming and there was a threat of Native Land Act of 1913, the gathering of priests, of civil society leaders, of teachers, of traditional leaders to mm -hmm. form the African Native Congress was that moment when they say, this cuts across, let's come together. Yeah. When in the 50s, there was the Freedom Charter and you had the Congress of the people and people coming from all over, it didn't say, are you a professional politician? Are you this and so forth? Again, we produced something. Yes, there would be critics of it sure. and those who embrace it, but something that we still refer to mm -hmm. up to this day. In the 80s, when apartheid was at its peak, P.W. Botha was at his peak, vicious and savage as he was mm. at the time. Mass democratic movement mobilized people, sports people, church people, artists, everybody. Each time we go into that reservoir of our maximum mobilization across different sectors, we see something beautiful out of this country. Mm -hmm. Each time we leave a particular group of people or the elite or political class to do things, you know, terrible things do happen. Yeah. Which means as we look forward and have a new social compact mm -hmm. and have a consensus building dialogue, we should be saying, how do we galvanize the entire society yeah. to take us from the detour we had taken back into the highway we had started with. It's interesting your assessment there as well that that first 10 year period we can easily forget given the challenges that you've alluded to but we we don't have to start everything from scratch and reinvent the wheel and there's a need to go back to when we did do things right best in the world sometimes mm -hmm. and relearn those lessons and revisit those those moves whether they're policy moves governance moves and not not assume that we we haven't actually done this once before in many ways certainly in fact i once asked a uh, few leaders in the midst of load shedding do we still remember that escom was once ranked number one in the world state-owned mm. company yeah 2001, wow. two and three, I think. Yeah. And I then went on to say, who was the chairperson then, Dr. Roll Corsa? Mm. Who was the CEO, Tulani Gabashi? Mm. Are they dead or alive? They are alive. <laughs> have they been conducted? No. Mm. We have this thing of never wanting to go to people who have done certain things well. Yeah 
because we think let's clean this slate and be creators of history. Mm. I'm going to be mighty. Even now at universities, uh, in the departments, in the organizations, yeah. there's no succession planning. Mm. The person who leaves, they leave like they are witches who bewitched the institution. <laughs> they never have the time to collect things from the drawer, yeah. let alone to sit with their uh, successors mm. and so forth. Mm. So we have these discontinuities. Yeah. And they even stop policies that had been started, even if they were good, because mm. they were associated with so-and-so mm. and so forth. So that in itself has really caused us to be on a treadmill. We look very busy running, but we're still on the same spot. And yet countries like China, Singapore, and mm. so forth, you have continuity. New yeah. leaders come in, Absolutely. they know that we have this grand vision, long term and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Now, in our case, new person comes, digits are removed, this and that is removed, furniture is changed, curtains are changed, as if those will even have an ideological view. <laughs> so, so that in itself yeah. is the problem of discontinuity. Yeah. And remember, for each policy, when you develop it and do public consultation, you spend millions mm -hmm. upon millions to just develop that. So... Up until we can understand what is in the national interest and in long term, more so now that you may even have more role players or even coalitions in other places and so forth. Mm. If we can have that national interest, patriotic goals, we will always be on a treadmill where we look like we're moving forward. Only the calendar moves forward. Mm. We're regressing. Of course, in, in your capacity as, as chairperson of the Public Service Commission now, I'm sure you've got some interesting insight into what it will take to bring um, true capability into the state so that whoever's governing, whichever party it might be, we, we have a state that we can trust to discharge its, its fundamental duties to the people. What kinds of things have you learned from you know this unique position that you're in about what's uh, frustrating state capacity and what we can do to improve it in the future? A number of things that I've observed. The first thing, it's fragmentation, duplication. Hmm. There's just lack of any integrated system or coordination. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Hence, a person who has stolen in province A will reappear in province B because hmm. you have no integrated system mm. hence a criminal in this province will reappear somewhere mm. no integrated system even at the borders and so forth mm. so that integration and yeah. complementarity instead of competition mm. should be at the core because you would be improving on your efficiencies and you would even be spending a fraction you see, if I give you one simple example that we learned when there mm. were floods in KZN. Yeah. Parliamentary committees were just going there to check and do oversight. Chapter 9 institutions were going there to do oversight and demand report. PSC as a Chapter 10 institution was going there. Provincial legislative committees were going there. <laughs> AG was going there. Mm. All are from the same government. Mm. They are flying, government. they are sleeping somewhere, mm. they are eating and so forth. Sure, yeah. More critically, they are taking people who would be on the ground assisting mm. to be in the offices trying to answer the same questions mm. they have answered several times. Mm. And not only that, you bound to then have this opportunity cost of saying, I could have been assisting people on the ground. These ones lost their IDs. Mm. What do we do with them? No, your force has to come and answer. Because yeah. if you don't answer, you may be found guilty of this. You mm. may lose your job. You may 
have a qualification your audit and so forth so we have started having these discussions mm -hmm. within the institution supporting democracy because they such a forum of chapter 9 10 13 institutions yeah so how okay. can we make sure that we streamline mm -hmm. the second one we have invested in our human resource development system on technical and cognitive skills you want to be a cfo you want to be a chartered accountant you want to be an engineer and so forth yeah but we have not paid much attention on the values and principles on the consciousness yeah the intrinsic values the norms of saying now that i'm doing this why am i doing it what is wrong what is right mm. So a more comprehensive, balanced approach is needed, which will have a value-based approach rather than just a rules-based approach sure. where people are doing the minimalist approach in order to win a G report. Mm. Let me just make the bar so low mm. that when I overachieve, I look like a genius, but the people I wanted to attend to feel nothing they are still in misery mm. Mm. so that becomes that gap between these annual reports we see self appraisals saying such great things great photos and the misery that you see at times yeah. so that in itself means you need to be rethinking about how do we create a people-centered and service-oriented public service mm. I could go on, there is a range of other things that uh, I noticed to my shock about the inefficiencies of the system. At the PSC, somebody came in to complain about not being given some of these monies, I don't know whether bonuses and so forth, Yeah. Um, because says the department won't yield to that. Mm. And uh, it turned out the person had been on paid suspension for 12 years 12 years other seven years wow i mean where, where on earth and there's there was still a request for a bonus on the I remember <laughs> <laughs> in our whatever payout there was yeah uh, in our system and this person apparently did the first degree or whatever second degree third degree yeah. did law articles and so forth whilst on that suspension wow <laughs> now the question PSC working with the Department of Public Service and the administration mm. been asking how many people are in these sure. in between cracks. Yeah, yeah. Another one was sent on special leave. Five years later it's being paid. Hmm. No one has ever bothered to check. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, where do I sign up for this? <laughs> so Imagine. When we've found ourselves in a space where the country is borrowing two billion rands per day yeah. and servicing that at almost a billion or more mm. per day, you see these leakages mm. in the system. They shock your system shock. because you never thought there would be such a thing. Yeah. Just like Prasa, they say there were ghost employees in thousands. Mm. If you were really serious about those things, if you heard that there was a ghost, you shut down the system and say anyone who has not come forward mm. will consider that person a ghost. Yeah. You end that ghost in one week. <laughs> but somehow people have been fascinated by these ghosts. Mm. They just report about them, that our ghosts are going to chase them. Mm. And months pass, a year pass. <laughs> and you start saying, have we lost common sense in this country? Mm. Because this is not a very complicated thing. Same as was the delivery of textbooks. Mm. When a country is on a standstill for months, textbooks are not delivered. We shouldn't even share such stories with other people and who are serious about statecraft. Mm. Because you just say, put the books in your books, uh, boots off your cars and just deliver these things. Mm. These tender things, you'll attend to them later yeah. and so forth. So those are some of the things... Mm just in summation that one has come across very um, interesting others very little the way people have been so used to dealing with cases of grievance 
or uh, you know public complaints about service delivery to the public service commission mm. one time when i just arrived i was asked as a commissioner to write to the minister uh, this student had not received their metric certificate for a year so they say right so that we investigate whatever i said no it's february now this person might be wanting to get to school mm. why would you sit down for three months investigating this thing did you sit in that corner and call your you know uh, counterpart i'll call the minister this side yeah we solve this thing so that the person gets the certificate the only letter i'll write mm. is the one which says can you check how many people in the country are in a similar predicament. Mm. So I could see the shock among some of the people because they are used to receiving this one mm. case mm. and so forth, not a broader impact, not the bigger picture. Maybe they've been doing this routinely, maybe for the longest time to yeah. say this is the protocol or the procedure. Hmm. So you need to disrupt <clears throat> some of these protocols yeah. and procedures yeah. which are quite bureaucratic and they bring this bureaucratic inertia. Mm. Thanks for watching SMWX. I just wanted to tell you if you're enjoying what you're watching, how you can help support this channel and keep us growing and becoming bigger and better. Become a member of the channel on YouTube. There are different membership plans and you can give us some fuel to fire the SMWX machine. Also, if you're a brand, I'm interested in building the community of people who watch this channel. And so if you want to advertise, I'm much more interested in the people who are already fans of this channel partnering with us than going out to some external advertising brand. So get in touch with us at our email address down below. You can also buy books and merchandise. Check the description for how to support SMWX and help spreading the fire. Of course, the more we do this, the bigger we can grow this channel, the more resources we can use to keep informing and entertaining you. Now let's get back to the episode. It's interesting you say that because I think w when we try to think what has gone wrong from a basic delivery perspective, the easy answer is just, you know, the government in that area was inept or corruption, you know, was, was the problem. And sure, those things definitely exist. But I'm not sure as a country, maybe even in academia, we've really theorized why have things not worked and, and how deep and how complex is it that things aren't working. And, you know, when when I look at the way we've constituted the country, not, not from a values perspective, but just from the tiers of government mm -hmm. and the layers of government, is there something that we've done there that's maybe holding us back? You know, and, and yep. when you talk about all this duplication, Maybe at some point we need to sit back and just say, is 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 this all working? And how could how can we avoid constituting this duplication over and over again? In fact, to me, I think some degree of overhauling and simplification would be needed. Let me hmm. give you one example. We meet with the Minister of uh, Home Affairs and his team complaints of people standing in long lines in the rain and so forth and in home affairs offices and he was quite honest <coughs> mm. and blunt first day people come in and they are told the network is down home affairs department and all other departments cannot do anything on their own to solve the network mm. they have to go to ict sita mm. So you monopolize this into an entity that by all indication at that time was not capable. Sure. Finally, after some days, this problem is solved. Person comes back mm. having borrowed money from some village or township. Sure. Then they're told, yeah, the network is back now, but we have load shedding. <laughs> So they have to go sure. home. Yeah. Then they say after some time you get another money to come back. <laughs> Network and electricity is back, but <laughs> municipality has cut water. So because of ablution facilities, we're not allowed to work. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we've created oh a gosh. complicated system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who has benefited from that? 
regulatory entities, lawyers, mm. audit firms, mm. and so forth, mm. who have become mm. a compliance and conformance society mm. Mm. to a point where you would rather return the money back rather than risk not complying, yeah. even if you could show the proof that I've done A, B, C, D, E. Yes, they will say you have policies that allow you for deviation and so forth, but the yeah. complication, the paperwork, and in some instances, you correct in saying what we have created is a giant mo monster, mm -hmm. which is a broken mirror. You can't even tell what it is. Mm. In some instances, you'll find that some people would rather return the funds in a very poor community hmm. because this tier of government cannot take a person to go and intervene there yeah and that one you saw the challenges in in Amanskral mm. where I, this is my sphere the other one this is my sphere yeah. and it happens across departments it happens mm. across units within departments it mm. happens in different spheres of government, it happened. Yeah. So we have this very complicated thing, mm. which now no longer works. And another example I'll give, very practical. We have hundreds or thousands of people who cannot access whatever assets bequeathed by those who have departed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Why? You are a poor person who's been sitting at home unemployed. They say, your parents now have left you this farm or this house and so forth. You can't register it because you need some 15,000, 20,000 rands to register it. You must go to conveyances, surveyors, this and that and so forth. So you have this complicated arrangement. Yeah. And I'll give you the last personal example of mm. these systems that we've created. I wanted to de demolish just a shed in my house in Pretoria. Mm. Just an ordinary shed. And they said, ah, municipality wouldn't allow for that. You must go through applications. Sure. So I applied. And one committee after the other. And just to demolish. Mm. And build something new. After 12 months of putting pressure, Finally, sure. the permission came. I had spent 25000 My goodness. When I built the new, uh, you know, outside house, it took me one month. So Shit. compliance had taken a year. So we've become mm. a compliance, a regulatory space. Even if you were to yeah. say, let's talk about land redistribution. Mm. Finally, they'll agree. Then you'll be told water license or some other things which will take years. Environmental impact assessment. We do not simplify our mm. things. Mm. Mm. Whatever we thought we were creating has become a monster yeah. to ourselves. Absolutely. And, and, and the funny thing is, it seems on the one hand, you've got corruption where it's so easy to be corrupt, but it's so hard to do the right thing because there's so many regulations that, that you don't want to put a foot wrong. And so we're in the worst of worlds where those who can do things quickly and right mm. are hamstrung and those who don't care about the rules. In fact, I'll give you a practical example. I was in my village and I think electricity fell, mm. uh, you know, whatever tripped and people had slaughtered and they wanted to keep their things in the fridge and so forth. And now, it's just before Christmas. They are calling ESCOM. Nothing is coming. Sure. One person finally just got an electrician to clamp and put up the switch. Hmm. Now, that's outside the law. Mm, mm. But we never see yeah. the non-coming of ESCOM as being outside the law. So true. So... To save that community, mm, mm. somebody had to do something that is commonsensical. Yeah. So to us, I do think that we need to just re-examine mm. this fascination 
with compliance with complicated systems and simplify them. In fact, once you simplify them, it's easier to be transparent. An ordinary person can tell you and so forth. Even when you do your taxes, when I was in uh, the US or Canada, they had a simpler system. Sure. You could predict what your returns are. Mm. But in our case, I think there's one book they showed me almost 700 pages with several rules and so forth. Mm. So we, we just become fascinated yeah. with the theory or with the architecture of things yeah. rather than their impact. In terms of corruption, because of course you've spoken a lot uh, mm. at, the, at the commission about not just a capable state, but an ethical state. Yes. Um, I know that, that you've spoken on various fora as well about corruption in the country and uh, our history of corruption and how we overcome that. What have you learned about uh, the way that corruption is working and how we can overcome it in your time at the commission? Sure. Uh, there are different kinds of corruption. Uh, the other one, is the one we spoke to when you have made the system so complicated that mm -hmm. people have to bribe others just to get into the same answer that they needed. Mm -hmm. And also the levels of inequality where policemen and nurse some way is having such little in such critical areas that they are on the verge of being, uh, you know, tempted all the time. Mm. Not to say all of them, because many are doing such a, a fantastic job. Sure. The other one, I do think that the appointment of HODs, heads of mm. departments, DGs, HODs, whatnot, had become so much of a political theater mm. in a space of a factionalized environment. Mm in a space of insecurity that loyalty became the number one requirement rather than mm. competence. And once that happens, you bring a person who is not competent. First, they'll rely on consultants because they do not know mm. what they're dealing with. And two, they'll try to do anything to please the person that they believe brought them in here. Yeah. So you already have a situation of vulnerability that creates corruption. Of course, over time, when these practices take place, it becomes routine to people to think that it is okay. When some leaders are caught and nothing happens to them, those below start thinking, mm. because you have to set the tone, mm. uh, you know, in many ways. So I do think that Corruption, for it to be tackled, it should be a multifaceted approach, promotion of constitutional values and principles and ethics, um, tightening the systems so that both incentives and punishment are equally firm and strong. Sure. Integrate your systems so that a person who has done wrong elsewhere is known everywhere else. Uh, so that you can be able, even your biometric, uh, you know, data, so that we know if Figeni has done something wrong here, wherever he goes, this record will keep coming up. Mm. So it's a range of things, but again, we must examine the relationship between the private sector and the public sector. Yeah. Because we have not paid much attention to that. When these things happened, audit firms, reputable ones, were there to assist some legal firms mm. were there to assist. Mm. Donor agencies, consultancy entities, and so forth were there to assist. Yeah. So that in itself tells us that the whole ecosystem needs revisiting. But the tone at the top should be set. And there should also be mechanism, which professionalization is trying to do, of defining and delineating the roles between the politics and the administration so that their interaction limits possibilities of mutual corruption or of uh, you know 
vulnerabilities that lead to people taking wrongful instructions. So those are some of the things that I think should be done. But strengthening institutions, though, is very important. We've paid too much attention to the political parties, to the political rhetoric, and so forth. And yet we forget that on daily basis, 63 million plus people, their interaction and their experience of the quality of democracy is with the public service frontline mm. workers, mm. back office workers. Sure. You want to renew your license, you want to pay for your bills, you want to get your ID, you want mm. to do all these other things, your driver's license, you want water to be fixed. Those are your public servants. And we've not paid much attention to those mm. in the rebuilding. But of course, if you already have 1.3 million or so public servants, some may have learned the wrong habits. Mm. The biggest question is, what mechanism would you embark on to make them to unlearn those things in order to relearn mm. the new norms so that we have a new moral code? That's why we're engaging with the South Africa Institute of Ethics uh, with moral regeneration and so forth to say, and universities, Tell us what would be the magic in this massive re-engineering and re-socialization mm. of public servants who are there. It was, you are not going to just wake up and say, I'm getting rid of sure. and so forth. As, as we conclude, uh, Prof, I suppose uh, one of the most interesting things that you've been championing at the commission is the professionalization of the public service. Uh, talk us through why you think this is so important and what steps can be taken from here to ensure that, of course, there's always going to be some politicization of the state, but how we get the best people into the, the most important roles in a, in a more efficient way. Thank you very much for that question. I do think that the professionalization framework of the public service, which has now been approved by a cabinet, and congratulations on that, by the way. And uh, it, thank you very much. It's a bold step that takes all these elements from different entities. The Zondo Commission criticized the states for weaknesses. AG mm -hmm. has been criticizing to say, what should be the reform program around which we rebuild the state capacity? Yeah. This professionalization, which is mainly emphasizing on building a meritocratic system came about having done comparative analysis of different countries, mm. of different contexts, to say this is what works. Right. It is looking at the whole ecosystem of how do we train human resources that will end up in the public service. Mm. How do we recruit with all the filters, including the integrity Absolutely. test? Absolutely. How do we recruit and have a panel of experts rather than just having ministers around mm. and one DG they've asked so that those experts from the fields of those departments brought from professional organizations or well-known in society sit there and they make their own input. They do the interviews as well mm. and so forth. Mm. The in-service training of those who are already inside yeah. performance assessment in a rigorous manner and consequence management mm. delineation of politics from administration mindful of the fact that you'll always have political appointees sure. in any democracy mm. you'll have those but they do not have the such an overbearing yeah. impact yeah on the technocrats and the professionals Absolutely. who are appointed. And they don't need to go all the way down the yes. department. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. You, you can't be getting even your cleaner being mm. a political deployee <laughs> uh, or being a person that you say, I want literally everybody yeah. to it. So you must. <laughs> and by the way, when we say that, our observation was that the practice of uh, deploying people because they are closer to you, political or otherwise, mm -hmm. just cuts across many parties. Absolutely. 
Yeah. It's not confined to one, yeah. but the greater your exposure to power, the greater is your vulnerability to that exercise. Yeah. So those are some of the things, promotion of, uh, you know, constitutional values and principles which are articulated in Chapter 10, Section 195 of the Constitution, which are making this people-centeredness uh, at the fore. But one thing, though, I want to say, as much as we focus on public service, I've raised this thing, and I think I'll keep raising it. Are all these things we're talking about possible if, one, you have mainly your African family having collapsed? where you get your first training about values, morality, and so forth mm. from your young age, before you even go to schools. So some attention by scholars, by policymakers, mm. should be made to say, how do we resuscitate a family? Mm. Of course, some people who are critics, they say, no, you know, family was conservative and mm. so forth. Mm. Family is like democracy. It is the first, it is the worst form of institution, except that nothing sure. better than it has ever been designed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Once you have a solid family that takes care of these values of social security, of many other social capital mm. or network there, it has a positive impact on community, community on society. So that's one thing. Mm. The second one, our education system. Because these are primary socializing agents. If you wanted to influence society in this or that direction, yeah. you must be deliberate. You must be intentional about what you want to do. The second part, levels of inequality makes it impossible for people to even exercise the democracy we're talking about. Mm, mm. To go to home affairs having to borrow money, to access certain services yeah. having to buy data and so forth, the levels of our inequality are scandalous. Mm. Something drastic ought to be done because you may have your first generation human rights right to demonstrate, right to associate, right to do this, right mm. of expression. Mm. If I'm sleeping on the sidewalk under the bridge, I could care less about those rights mm. because I just want to check if I'll eat today. If in the next elections, many people will have to choose whether they are on the street lights to get some of the coins they are given, mm. or they go to queue in a voting line. And you know the choice. Yeah. Let's not present our people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder with choices which are choiceless. Because inequality makes it impossible. Now, generally, it's the NGOs, some of them well-resourced, it's the few individuals, mm. And they sometimes have occupied the space. Yes, some are doing wonderful work, but people have no agency themselves. Mm. And lastly, our public discourse about our democracy has some weaknesses. We tend to emphasize rights. We hardly ever talk about the responsibilities. Any functioning system or society, you have rights, you have responsibilities. You withdraw, you deposit. But in ours, the public discourse has been the one of withdrawal, withdrawal. Mm. And when the machine is empty, so that has created some degree of dependency. Sometimes it must have been well-meaning. Sometimes some are say it's cynical so that those who control will always use this lever. Mm. We've not talked about self-reliance, how people should work towards self-reliance with the state assisting them to realize that. Yeah. So those are some of the things 
which may look removed from public sector, but they are connected. Well, Professor Soma Dota Figeni, we're really grateful that you could give so much of your time for our audience. Thank you very much for joining us on SMWX. My pleasure for inviting me. And again, greetings to your viewers and thanks for taking time to view and uh, even critique <laughs> what I will have said. Thanks so much. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you for the next episode. Aye.